All right, chapter 13, abstract classes and interfaces. Let's get right to it. What is an abstract class? What is an abstract method? An abstract method is a method that has no implementation, which sounds kind of weird. How can a method have no implementation? But that's exactly what it is. An abstract method, think of it as just having the method header, nothing else, with a semicolon at the end. That is an abstract method. And it's gonna have the keyword abstract as part of that method header as an indicator to tell Java, hey, there's no implementation of this method, it's just an abstract method. We're really defining a method that's not really being implemented. For what purpose? We're about to cover that. What is an abstract class? The short answer, an abstract class is a class that cannot create new objects. You cannot create objects from an abstract class. Also, an abstract class will usually have one or more abstract methods. In fact, if a class has an abstract method, meaning a method with no implementation that has the keyword abstract as part of its signature, as part of its header, that class must in turn be abstract. These abstract methods are then going to be implemented in any subclasses that inherit from that abstract class. So some more details before we cover an example. So abstract classes, they're like regular classes, but you cannot create objects from these classes using that new operator. An abstract method, once again, is defined without giving any implementation. The implementation of that abstract method is given in the subclasses. A class that contains an abstract method, I mentioned, must in turn be abstract. A, an abstract class, it still has a constructor, though. And you might be thinking, well, that's weird. Didn't you just say we can't create objects from an abstract class? Why, therefore, would we need a constructor? It's a great question. But subclasses will not be abstract, and they will be creating object objects. And when those subclasses create objects, we will need a constructor of that superclass, which is abstract, to help construct that object. When you create an instance of a concrete subclass, the superclass constructor is invoked, as I just mentioned. Finally, when we're doing UML, the names of abstract classes and the abstract methods are italicized. So what's some of the value here? We're gonna to get to the value. We think about that inheritance hierarchy. We have classes that get more specific and more concrete, right, as we make each new subclass. And then when you move from a subclass back up to the superclass, the classes become more general, right? So class design should ensure that a superclass contains common features of the subclasses. And sometimes a superclass is just too general, too abstract that it doesn't, can, it doesn't ever get used to create specific instances because it's just too vanilla. Such a class is called an abstract class. So we're gonna go through an example and then we'll talk about the value here. So the example we're gonna cover is the geometric object class that we've seen previously with the circle subclass, with the rectangle subclass. Both of those subclasses have a get area method as well as a get rectangle method to calculate, a get area method as well as a get perimeter method to get or to compute the area and the perimeter of the circle and the rectangle respectively. The idea behind abstract methods is as follows. Suppose you, could, you can compute areas and perimeters for all geometric objects. Even though you can, it's better to define the get area and the get perimeter methods inside the geometric object class. However, you can't actually implement the get area method inside the geometric object class because the geometric object class is so general if we tried to implement the area, we would say, well, how? Is it a length times a width because it's a rectangle? Or is it a pi r squared? Or is it, you know, area of a triangle when a one half base times height, area of a hexagon? How do we know what is the shape in question? So because the geometric object is so vanilla, 
we can't actually we can't actually compute the area or 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 have the implementation of that area method inside the geometric object class right the actual implementation needs to be inside the subclasses so such methods are referred to as abstract methods if we put that get area method inside the geometric object class but with no implementation it would be considered an abstract method and we would have to put the abstract modifier in the method header and then after you define those methods in the geometric object class that class then becomes abstract but again what's the purpose what's the value that's coming right here but first uml so here we have this geometric object class it has everything we've seen previously and then we have the circle and the rectangle classes both of these classes you know they previously had right here where you see the mouse moving they previously had a get area and a get perimeter method and then the rectangle also had a get area and a get perimeter method you no longer see those methods as part of the specific circle class and rectangle class instead those methods are now part of the super class the parent class geometric object and they're shown here and they're public methods so they're going to be inherited but they're abstract methods and they are italicized abstract meaning that although they are defined in the super class in the parent class geometric object geometric object of course cannot implement those methods so they're abstract although they're defined in geometric object and now the subclasses circle and rectangle will inherit those two methods and they must provide an implementation they meaning the circle class must provide an implementation the rectangle class must provide an implementation so why do we do it this way why do we not just put the get area and get perimeter method here and here instead of putting it up in the parent why do we do it this way and why is this the better approach what's the value proposition we want to go over that but do hear me clearly the incorrect approach is what we've done previously because we did not know and understand abstract methods the correct approach is to put the get area and the get perimeter methods as an abstract method in the parent class and then the subclasses will inherit those public abstract methods and will provide an implementation for them to see the value proposition it's best to go through this with an example so ultimately i'm going to come to this code but i'm going to show you this in netbeans and here we go i come to netbeans here we have the geometric object class i do not need to go over this we've seen it previously we have data members constructors getters and setters right and then we even have a date object whether or not we've seen that previously it's not a big deal and here we have an overridden to string method the only thing that is new is these two abstract methods notice a normal method would be like this right and since it says return double we would have return 1.0 for example it's a double and we would not have the word abstract right here that's a normal method but now what do we have we don't return anything we don't have curly brackets instead we have a semicolon and we have the word abstract what we're defining here is we're telling java hey this parent class we have defined these two methods they are abstract there's no implementation which is why there's no pair of curly brackets it's just a semicolon zero implementation but we've defined them as abstract we've made them public and so now any child class that in turn inherits from this class such as circle circles extending geometric object the circle class will receive a copy of that abstract method with no implementation and the circle class is supposed to provide its own unique implementation which i'm zooming in on right here notice we have override because yes we are overriding that method in the parent although the parent has no implementation we are still actually overriding that method in the parent so if i delete the override annotation it's going to ask me to put it back in there to indicate that hey this method was defined by the parent but as abstract notice i'm not putting abstract here i can't 
because there's an implementation, right? You can't put the word abstract. It said abstract methods cannot have a body if you look at that error. So I don't put the word abstract because now I'm providing the implementation. And what is the implementation? It's just radius times radius times math times pi. And notice in rectangle, we also have the implementation for get area and get perimeter. In fact, this is what we had before. And in circle, this is what we had before, get area and get perimeter. The only thing that's really changing here is these two abstract methods. If I comment those two methods out, I then come over here to circle. I need to, of course, comment out these two overrides because they don't exist. They're not overriding anything because that method did not exist in the parent. And then I need to comment out these two overrides. And we're good, but now we're gonna have an error over in our main, which I won't cover just yet. So this is what we had before. We already have the get area method and the get perimeter method defined in the circle class. And we have the get area method and the get perimeter method defined in the rectangle class. So what is different now? What's different is we are not defining these strictly within the circle and rectangle class. Rather, we are defining those two methods here inside the geometric object class as abstract methods. And then the two children classes, circle and rectangle, will inherit those methods and they will provide their own unique implementation. Here is the unique implementation of get area for circle, and this rectangle class also inherited from geometric object, and the rectangle provided its unique implementation for get area, which is of course the width times the height is the area of a rectangle versus the area of a circle, pi r squared, radius times radius times pi. Okay, but what's the value? Like you get all of that, what is the value proposition? Why are we doing this? So let's come back over here to our main and let's see what is an advantage of doing this. So here we've created a circle object and a rectangle object. And via the power of polymorphism, we are saving these two objects into the more vanilla super type geometric object. So I could have saved this, of course, into circle and I could have saved this new rectangle into a rectangle reference, but I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Instead, what I opted to do is to save them both into a data type of geometric object, of something more vanilla, which was allowed via polymorphism. Why? Because now when I call this equal area method, I'm going to send over these two references of type geometric object, and here I just want to check. Do the two objects have the same area? And I'm going to call this equal area method. It's just going to return a Boolean. It's going to print true or false. It's literally just going to print true or false. It's pretty basic. Let me hit run here. And I got to open up my output window. The two area, the two objects have the same area. The answer is false. Well, let's understand what happened and why this is valuable here. So I'm sending over a reference of type circle to here, and the, re the reference of rectangle comes here to these actual parameters, and they're sent over to the formal parameters, these two placeholders. And what do we return? I merely return object one dot get area equal equal object two dot get area. It just returns true or false. And you're thinking, yeah, I get that. Well, you get it because it's easy, but we never showed this before. Because be previously, we would not have been able to do this because object one, which is of type geometric object, did not have a get area method. There was no get area method of geometric object because it was not defined in geometric object. But by defining that get area method inside geometric object, now I can actually call that get area method from the vanilla geometric object and Java, the Java virtual machine will, at runtime, will determine via dynamic binding, hey, this vanilla geometric object here is calling a get area. Well, what area is being called? The get area from the rectangle or the get area from the circle? And at runtime, the Java virtual machine will determine that this get area, which is being called from object one, 
is in fact a circle because it can trace it back. It can use the instance of, and it can tell it's a circle object and it will call the circle implementation of get area. And here the same thing happens for object two, get area. And so the value is we're able to now call this get area method from the super class making this code so much cleaner. And here is just display geometric object. And I'm up here, I call display geometric object and I send over those two objects, object one and object two. And we display those objects by simply printing the area is object dot get area object dot get perimeter. The main takeaway is that we're able to use the super type, the super class, and invoke those abstract methods. And then the Java virtual machine at runtime will determine which subtype that reference object is of. Is it of subtype circle? or is it of the subtype rectangle? It determines that at runtime, and then it automatically, using dynamic binding, determines which get area or get perimeter method to use. That's really the value here. Here we're back at the slides and at the code, and what I have here in the next couple of slides or pages, if you wanna pause, you can pause and look over, is really a summary of what I just covered, a summary of what that main is doing, creating the two geomet geometric objects, invoking this equal area method to check whether two vanilla geometric objects have the same area uh, and then calling the display geometric object. And it, it goes over what's happening, how we're actually saving those references into the more vanilla super type, super class geometric object, and then calling this equal area method, which then invokes the get area abstract method, which in turn invokes the correct implementation either inside the circle class or inside the rectangle class. So I'd pause the video, read over those, see if you're okay, and then coming back one more time in summary to the value. So using that example, we could not define that equal area method for comparing whether two geometric objects have the same area if that get area method had not been defined inside the super class. That's really the value. To get to this more generic programming by moving that definition or the defining of those get area and get perimeter methods inside the super class, now we can more generically code and use geometric object references without even though having to then cast them into the specific circle or rectangle objects, we can just now check, hey, does this geometric object one, does its area equal the area of that other geometric object? Well, because it's now defined inside the super class as an abstract method, we're able to do this, which is super cool. By making a method abstract, the super class has effectively become a bit of a bully, to be honest. That super class, has bullied anyone and everyone who ever wants to inherit from it. Hey, you can inherit from me, but if you do, you have to implement this method because I have an abstract method. And if you inherit from me, you're going to inherit that abstract method. And you in turn have to provide an implementation for that method. That's option one. Option two, which is an or if you don't provide an implementation for that method, but you're inheriting from me. So if you inherit an abstract method and you don't provide an implementation, that means the method is still abstract. Ah, which means what? That means that subclass has to in turn be abstract because we said any class that has an abstract method, it has to be an abstract class. So if you inherit from an abstract super class, and you inherit those abstract methods, you have one of two choices. You either have to provide an implementation for all of those abstract methods, so you don't have to be an abstract class. You can be known as a concrete class, meaning all of your methods have an implementation. Or you can say, you know what? You made me inherit this method, but I don't want to give it an implementation. I don't want to. That's fine. But now you in turn, this subclass in turn, has to now also be abstract. 
So if a superclass knows that all of its subclasses will end up creating some method with the same purpose, the same name, but implemented differently based off of the specifics of the problem, such as the circle method, the circle class having a get area, the rectangle class having a get area, the triangle class having a get area. If a superclass knows this is happening, it's best for the superclass to define that method. And then now by defining it and making it abstract, that superclass has forced any subclass that inherits from it to actually inherit that abstract method and then provide an implementation for that abstract method. What follows on these next few slides are just some more bullet points summarizing everything we've covered, and this is gonna be super short. So any, an abstract method cannot be contained inside a non-abstract class, period. Any class that has an abstract method must be abstract. And if a subclass of an abstract superclass does not, there is a party outside and it is super noisy and that's okay. If a subclass of an abstract superclass does not implement all those abstract methods as we just covered, that subclass has to in turn become abstract. We've covered all of this. In other words, a non-abstract subclass extended from an abstract class, all of the abstract methods must be implemented. That makes sense? We have an abstract superclass. If we inherit from that abstract superclass, but we don't want to be abstract, then we have to provide an implementation for all of the abstract methods. I covered already that an abstract class, you cannot create objects of that class using the new keyword, but you still have a constructor because subclasses will construct objects and your constructor of the superclass that is abstract has to be there to help construct those objects. Here this note is saying that sometimes you'll have an abstract class with no abstract methods at all, in which case you might say, well, why would it be abstract? Why would we make an abstract class with no abstract methods? And the answer is a short one, simply because maybe you don't want to allow the creation of objects of that superclass, and this is why we would do so, in which case you would make it abstract and only the subclasses could be instantiated. A subclass can be abstract even if the superclass is concrete, which is obvious, right? Because the object class is concrete and every class of the ob every subclass of object can be either concrete or abstract, but the object class is in fact concrete. Finally, of course, we can use an abstract class as a type. You can use it as a data type where we can take, here we had geometric object was a data type being used to save a circle reference and rectangle was a reference being saved also into a geometric object. So we're not making new geometric objects here. We're making new circles and new rectangles and we're saving them into the data type of geometric object. That's it. That was quick. That was also fast. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? You have to tell me. We'll chat in class. It's been fun. Take care, everyone.